50 plus countries across the continent. Wow. So you really understand the terrain and, I you know, do. yeah. So, so tell us a bit more about your experience with the Tony Illumili Foundation, which, you know, which you've since left, but, you know, you've had so much experience understanding the entrepreneurship ecosystem across the continent. So what, what are your top, you know, what were your top takeaways having kind of moved on from that scene and moving into more of the agri focus that you're, you're, no, you're no, no. Well, I think you never move on. I think once you, you know, I mean, you know, entrepreneurship was in my life, was in my blood before I went to Africa. Um, and I had traveled across the African continent making films. I, you know, my first career is as a filmmaker and that's what had taken me. In fact, it was watching the films from the Ghana Film School, um, the Film Institute, you remember? Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, but literally, so film is what brought me to Africa um, and telling African stories, working with African directors and writers. Um, so, you know, arriving at the, in 2014, arriving at the foundation, or being given the opportunity um, to come and help operationalize a vision of investing a hundred million dollars in empowering um, African entrepreneurs through training, funding, and mentoring was an unmissable opportunity. And so I rose to the challenge at the age of 57, left the comfort zone of Northwest London mm -hmm. and found myself living in Ikoi in Lagos, Nigeria. And Lagos is, as you know, one of the most vibrant cities in the world. Right, right. right. Um, I think, I mean, I, you know, the, 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 there were many, many sort of legacies that one can, you know, reflect back on um, or reflect forward on because the real challenge is, is, not, is you know, you can structure a program which is made in Africa by an African for Africans. Um, you can, you know, through which the entrepreneurs selected from 54 African countries in the three languages, the colonial languages, French, Portuguese, and English, um, who went through, over 9,000 of them went through the program over five years. Um, but it's always the impact, isn't it? Yeah, and, the, and I felt that the seeds that we had planted over the last five years through the entrepreneurship program were only beginning to sprout now. Yeah, and then bang. You know, the COVID yes. pandemic hit and you know, and I know that, you know, like 80% of the African economy is, is, in, is run by SMEs. And now two out of three will probably not be around as we come through this COVID. So the, the you know, measuring impact was always going, you know, was the most important thing. You know, it's like, you, you know, you don't, you're not just throwing money um, at an opportunity, but it's all well, what's the impact of that. Yeah? Right. And I think the you know the, the biggest challenge now is how do we make sure that the African SMEs are not um, are not forgotten, are not left out of the rebuilding and reimagining of Africa. Right, and and this is a moment of, of reimagining Africa and. You know, for Scale Up Africa, it's all about figuring out what, what we can learn from what has come before and moving on to really take advantage of the opportunities that this presents for us to really, you know, do our housekeeping and, and do the right things to have the, the impact that we want in terms of better quality SMEs that perform enough to scale, get more investment and create the jobs that we desperately need across the continent because we know how difficult the recovery will be for African entrepreneurs in particular, but, you know, the economy as a whole, the socioeconomic impact has been tremendous. And so um, we're, we're very keen to have conversations like this with people like you. I mean, I think I, I met you about four years ago in Lagos at a summit, the High Growth Africa Summit that uh, Ingressive put on with um, Maya, Maya and uh, Dotam. Yeah, that was about four or five years ago now. Gosh, time has flown by. Yeah, and obviously it's so much momentum um, since then, like, as you say, then bam, you know, here we are. But the question is, what do we do as an ecosystem, as a collective, to really reassess what's come before and figure out where we need to focus on? And so for us, I have, our hypothesis is really about the fact that we need to get more serious about the data. Where's a high growth going to come from? 
and where you know do we really throw our resources as you know entrepreneurship support organizations as funders as investors to make sure that we're, we're really backing the right horses um, that would really drive the economy forward um, in a post-COVID world so I mean do you have you had any thoughts about what that may look like in terms of specific sectors or um, focus areas that could actually deliver the jobs that we need to see and the economic growth that we see post-COVID from investors and, and oh my and gosh lots I mean I think these are the conversations that we need to be having now right because mm -hmm the funding landscape, the business development support landscape, the entrepreneurship, um, the entrepreneur support organizations, all of the ecosystem is, is really under threat right now. Yeah? Right. Um, but I think one of the things that's really amazed me is how the African SMEs have risen to the challenge, Correct. to this COVID challenge, yeah? How they have you know, re-examined their business models, yeah? how they have, um, you know, repurposed their products and services, literally how they have managed to not just thrive, and some of them are even, even I mean, not just survive, but even thrive. Thriving. I think the key thing that for me is really that the African SMEs now must organize, right? Before it's been, you know, and that the, S the African SMEs now bec must become self-dependent and independent right. yeah um, in terms of you know yes they were building businesses developing products and services but now more than ever that this you know that we can't rely SMEs cannot rely on on the kind of I don't know the the entrepreneurship development programs you know and I know that a lot of entrepreneurs just saw this as you know I'll go from one program to the next to the next right some professional right. entrepreneur program. Um, right. We call them pitchpreneurs here. Oh, okay. Pitchpreneurs. So pitchpreneurs. Yes, right? literally. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, whereas, you know, so there is a need for those who are serious about this entrepreneurial journey. Mm. You know, I really believe now the African SMEs must organize, must learn to lobby their governments. Yeah. These budgets, these stimulus packages are a moral contract and African SMEs, you know, one at a time cannot make a dent in that, yeah? They have to accept that the government is now going to become, has already played a critical role over the last three months, the governments across the 54 African countries. So the role of governments becomes even more fundamental now in our lives across the world, but particularly mm -hmm. across the African continent. There was a time I remember over my last five years where you could ignore the government. My gosh, you know, the government is bureaucratic, it's an obstacle, it's better not to even go there. Engage, right. Corruption and, and all those, you, you know, know, bad leadership and all those things we always complain about. But, you know, but I think we have to stop complaining. You know, don't tell me they're corrupt. Don't tell me they're bureaucratic. Don't tell me the leadership sucks. Actually hold your government accountable. And the African SMEs have the solutions that the African governments, policymakers, the development, the international development agencies are going to need in order for the economic um, recovery of Africa. Right. So I think lobbying and learning how to work with your government and having a voice at the table, not sitting outside waiting for some policy to be passed, and that has doesn't have your stamp on it. Yeah? So yeah. is that something about the co-creation of policies and strategies and initiatives and programs? Because even some of these programs that are, you know, that are that have been launched in the name of African SMEs don't, you know, they don't, they're not, they're useless. They don't work. That, yeah? that is why we we set up Scale Up Africa. Africa after oh, okay. many years of observing the ecosystem um, and we're not here to say you know uh, it's it's an exclusive thing we, we all need to as you said co-create a solution that actually fits the, yeah. the demands you know in terms of looking at the marketplace looking at the needs of our SMEs maybe focusing more on quality um, longer term support as opposed to short sharp programs and, um, and you know um, people gathering in hotel rooms and just, you know, observing someone coming from abroad to tell them how to do entrepreneurship. That's not the nature of the support that we need. We need people to work on their businesses and help them to guide them through over a longer period of time. And I think 
I think that's what we're going to need a lot of in the next few years, especially where we, no, we look at a post-COVID world. And the African SMEs need to be a part of that co-creation and, and, and the structuring and designing of those programs. Why I didn't balk at the idea? Because I'm an entrepreneur. I know what are the 10 fundamentals it takes to set up and run a business. Yeah, And I apply that, but I also know that the local conditions under which my business is, being, is going to run or operate, yeah? one also has to take that into consideration and you know and that was for me the nine months in designing it those nine months were precious in terms of actually researching and observing and seeing the stark reality under which african startups or african entrepreneurs were having to operate yeah so i think that you know you're absolutely right so the role of government I think the role of the corporate and the business sector is also going to be fundamental, right? Why? Because that's where the supply chain is. Right. right. Exactly. That's where the value chain is. Yep. And it is in those supply chains where the African startup or the SMEs brings a solution. Now, if those are denied to you, you are literally, you know, I mean, I guess you could say you're literally standing on a treadmill and going round and round. Right? Correct. Correct. I think the African the corporate sector and the business sector must stop looking outwards for their big IT solutions, for their big, you know, Im, you know, importing um, skills and talents from outside. They must turn to the African talent and African SMEs across all the sectors, all the growth sectors, right? Mm -hmm. you know, whether it's agriculture, manufacturing, IT, um, healthcare, education. Education, yeah, correct. You know, across all of those, you know, and I know, I mean, in fact, I remember taking one of our entrepreneurs, we were in Uganda, presenting them, we presented them to their president, and she stood up, she's an IT entrepreneur, and said, you know, dear Mr. President, why is, you know, why does our government not in take, employ um, Ugandan IT software developers? Because we have those skills, right? We do, we have the talent right here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what we need to do, what this virus for me has even, I mean, I knew this before, but now it's really like staring you in the face, which yeah. is the local talent is there. They can make masks. They can fix your computers. They can come up with the solutions, solutions. particularly as Africa is, you know, we, it was already leapfrogging technology, right? Now it's, a, it's accelerated it even more as everybody across the continent has gone online yeah and um, so i you know so that's the for me those corporate and those big corporates whether they're african corporates and businesses or whether they're multinationals coming into the continent they have to begin to st stop and start hiring african Local talent yeah yeah yeah. Talent, yeah it's like we, we've yeah, been yeah. we've been working in the same office all these years parminda you're, you're kind of it's like you've been in all our meetings and discussing all the issues and th these are the things that we we really oh, want now, to highlight yeah but now it becomes even more pertinent because before it was you just waited for the crumbs to fall off the table and then you got a bit of a contract there procurement you know the african governments are going to have to change their procurement methods and processes so that african smes small medium high growth companies have an opportunity to be able to pitch for those contracts yeah because otherwise you're talking about otherwise you're talking about a lifestyle and entrepreneurship isn't a lifestyle it's a it's it's a livelihood huh? yeah it's got to be self-sustaining as well and they have to they have we have to very clearly define distribution channels and, and channels that will enable more of SMEs to grow and scale. And as you said, procurement is actually the number one, you know, government and big corporates as well. So a, a big part of our conversation on the 6th of um, August is, is to speak to big corporates about how they have been able to pull up SMEs through programs like this. You know, you have Waira, Waira's Gary Stewart, who we have on, we have, you know, Cosmos Innovation Center, who are big, um, you know, a, a supporter of agribusinesses. Yeah. In, in Ghana in particular, but that's a, their flagship program. All the, you know, Telefonica has done very well with, uh, with uh, Waira and, and, you know, plugging uh, the SMEs that go through that program into the, the big corporations. Um, you know, Telefonica is a massive tel telco for those who, who are not aware. And so that, that's really had a tremendous results. So 
we, we only echo that and hope to kind of um, influence the discussion and influence more corporations to, um, you know, get, get in on the program and just understand the, the impact of what they could possibly do by changing their procurement practices. So government, corporate and business, big business. It's amazing lobbying, as you said. Yeah, and absolutely. Right. Um, and then obviously consumers, you know, I really think, you know, African consumers, I mean, you know, the amount of capital flight out of the continent is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. You know, Africa before sustained the world, right? And particularly those who colonized the continent, whether it was you, primarily, I guess, Europe, yeah, or European countries, the extraction that, you know, the, ex the you know, that was, the ex I mean, through extraction stuff that was taken out of the continent, yeah? But then, you know, I, I was shocked when I would hear of people jumping on a plane to come and see a doctor in Dubai or in India or in the UK, or that their children had been educated in the British or American education system from literally kindergarten to university. Right. Can you imagine the billions of dollars that has denied you building your own health infrastructure, that you deny, you've denied yourself building your own education infrastructure. Can you imagine? And now with COVID, they couldn't get on a plane. Yeah. And just come, right? And so sure, faced with the realities on the ground. Um, and so it's like really re reimagine Africa, where actually Africa becomes, or certain parts of Africa, you know, there are certain parts which become the destination for healthcare, destination right. for high quality education. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about just the obvious ones, you know, whether it's South Africa, but I actually look at, you know, across the continent and begin to build that, the, the, you know, the infrastructure so that Africans really begin to buy African, begin to consume African, yeah? I think it's possible. I think there's no reason um, I believe there's no reason why, um, you know, Africa continues to be in the state that it is. There is no reason why. And if, you know, I believe that we mustn't, um, for me, the coronavirus sitting here engaging with African SMEs across the continent, it's a, it's a huge opportunity. But it does require reimagining those three, for me, are the pillars, the society, government and, um, and, and business um, and reimagining those in, in, in relation to how to rebuild Africa so that it actually benefits the people of Africa. I agree. I, I, I agree 100%. <laughs> we, and we, we can agree only because we've seen how, I mean, I've seen it in, you know, this happened in the continent of my birth. Same, similar population, 1.2 billion. That's what we have across the African continent. Mm -hmm. India is 28 states. Africa is 54 very different and diverse countries. Mm -hmm. right? But the point is, you know, Africa does have these institutions, the African Union. Well, you know, Africa Union, you did rise to the challenge in COVID. Now you have to continue to play that leadership role. Right. Bringing the African continent together creating those economic blocks, enabling that intra-Africa trade to take place. Because you don't need to, you know, if you can literally market your products and services to the 54 markets that you already have, everything else is an icing on the cake. So what are your thoughts on the free trade, uh, con the continental free trade agreement and how that that will pan out in reality because everyone's talking about the de the devil is always in the detail like in terms of really taking advantage of such an opportunity how will that really be delivered on the ground but you know it's not new look at the you know we have a the european union effectively yeah. is a trade organized body right you have the you have similar bodies in asia you have it in latin america you have it within the arab speaking world so it's, you know, I mean, it's just Africa, you know, the African trade agreement is coming slightly late to the table, but it's never late, it's, you know, I guess is you know, it's, it's better late than never. Huh? But what amazed me was when, in, again, going back to the, the program, one of the things that I really loved was how we connected 
the continent, the 54 African countries, through entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. So the, and then we would have them come once a year. They would gather, they would gather obviously online as a, as a growing network. But then they would physically meet each other, obviously, at the, um, the TEF Entrepreneurship Forum. And I observed both online and offline how the entrepreneurs were creating their own intra-Africa trade. Right. They were already beginning to learn from best practice, share. There was peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange, information exchange, um, trade exchange. Oh, you need peanuts. You need brown nuts for your business in Gambia. I know who, where you can, we can source that for you in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know what? I, I've just started a, a drone, a business which uses drones to monitor building and tracking of your home. Well, actually, you know, the biggest, you know, opportunity for commercial as well as um, um, residential property is in Nigeria. You know, a lot of the, you know, um, diaspora and Nigerians are coming back and building homes. Well, actually, you can deploy this technology here, yeah? Or a Nigerian drone, you know, expert entrepreneur said, I'm using my drone technology for farmers here in Nigeria, but actually I could bring it to Ghana. I could yeah. take to Zambia. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Extraordinary intra-Africa um, exchange of information, knowledge, and trade was beginning to happen already. Um, but I think the, the agreement well, hopefully it is the, you know, the devil is in the detail, I agree. And that hopefully all the countries will sign up to that. But it, they've got to make it work. You've got to make it work. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're going to be able to move goods from one country to the next, we're going to be able to travel, you know, a lot of, I mean, craziest things. Have you tried going from one African to the other? I know. I have a friend, a very good friend of mine, who tried to just... Uh, get her car driven from Lagos to Accra with a Lagos number plate and she got stopped something like over 30 times because she had it along the way something like 30 times and mm. uh, so it, it you know we're all very uh, keenly watching the space to see how all these kinds of things I, I would say that we mustn't just any any of this stuff we mustn't keenly watch it we must participate in oh, of course of we, course yeah we must um organize so you know, before it was like, you know, the EU met, the AU met, sorry, and they discussed inter-Africa trade and here, the, you know, then they would cascade the policies down. But actually now the policies needs to be cascaded. Bottom up. Yeah. Bottom up, right. And, you know, and that's where, and, you know, your platform has to become a real catalyst um, and a real voice to from through which what you know different voices and you have to make those connections because there are lots and you know, i mean i think the covid has really spurred a lot of the entrepreneurs the smes because they couldn't open their shops or whatever um so it's like what you know i mean they recognize that when they try to go and access the stimulus packages whether in south africa nigeria ghana or whatever it wasn't a walk in the park it wasn't as easy as it was for you and I if we were had businesses in the UK, right? Right. You know, you just got furloughed and you were still getting your wage, you know, mm -hmm. in your bank account, yeah? Right, right. Um, and that has not been the case. That has not been the experience of African SMEs. It's a hard lesson learned, but now is the time to shift and, and really make those interventions and make them so that they have, you know, that they actually have an impact on how you, on your survival and your growth as, 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 a, as an entrepreneur or as a business owner. Yeah? Right, right. My final question is about African capitalism. <laughs> I, I, remember, I remember that concept very well and, uh, you know, it, it kind of gained some traction a few years ago. Uh, what do you think that looks like now, you know, in a post-COVID world? Well, I mean, I think, you know, without capital, right? There is no business. Yeah? You need capital. Yeah? Um, and the people who have capital, they all these, you know, disasters come and go. They don't really, it doesn't touch them. It's once they have capital, they're able to deploy it and, and diversify. 
so you know from one of the that was one of my there were three things that attracted me to go and work in the foundation one of them was his economic philosophy of Afro capitalism and it's very simple which is that the private sector has a role a major role to play in the economic transformation of Africa we've seen the political transformation of Africa right we've had the independence movement we've had the flag independence beyond that yeah but what Africa now needs is economic independence yeah and the private sector has a major role to play in that you know the governments should do what they are good at they should be building the roads they yeah. should be building the airports they should be laying the last mile you know connectivity yeah they should <laughs> fix power <laughs> so that, you know african smes can actually run their businesses yeah fix the roads wherever you are you know i've been to, driven through accra and driven through lagos mm. the roads are not that different mm. Mm. They should, you know, so the governments should do all of the things that they're good at and what they're mandated to do. But let the private sector really stimulate the economy, yeah? Really create those jobs, yeah? Because that's what SMEs and that's what African, and that is the fundamental tenet of Afro-capitalism. That so what do you say, sorry, sorry to cut you, but what do you say to those who are like, oh, you know, I could put my money in treasury bills and get my 20 plus percent and put my feet up. What do you say to an entrepreneur like that, um, given your experience with Tony Ilumelu, what he's been able to do for the ecosystem, how do we basically replicate Tony's model to have more people like him and, you know, James Mwange from Kenya? How do we create more, um, you know, corporate leaders like that to really push through and in terms of angel investment, you know, ecosystem building, uh, procurement opportunities for SMEs and that kind of thing. What, what, what would your final word be on that kind of thing? No, I think it's really important that Tony is able to do this because he built a successful business, just, right. you know, and he took on despite, you know, I'm sure had a lot of regu regulation challenges. Um, he built a very successful yes. bank, a bank which is now in 20 countries. So he's a businessman, yeah? Um, so, and, you know, and he, like he said, you know, I don't want to be, you know, you can only have so many houses and yachts and whatever, right? Um, and I don't, you know, I mean, who's going to remember Tony Illumilu because he had the biggest bank account? No. You know, what was in his bank account? What they will remember Tony Illumilu because he touched thousands of lives with the, with the money that he had made and redeploying that money. But I think for me, Afri capitalism isn't about, it's about, it's about, you know, embracing that you can generate revenues, you can make, you can create wealth and you can do good at the same time. Right? Right, right. And I think that is very different to a bunch of capitalists who are just literally out there just to make money at no matter whether it's the destruction of the environment or, you know, society or whatever, that's not what this economic philosophy, this economic philosophy is saying. But yes, you know, believe in, we believe in making profit. We believe in the, the you know, the importance of private sector and, and, and business, yeah. But we also believe that these, the business and the private sector must come with a sense of social responsibility. And so that is what, is Afri capitalism, right? So that, you know, generations to come, you're still not, you know, you're not still trying to solve the African poverty problem. Okay. And, but, and finally, I think Afri capitalism is also saying to African business leaders, like himself, like Dangote, like Murray Abraham and others, they're saying that we must, you know, Africa made us, you know, Murray Abraham was made because the telecom sector was suddenly opened up, right? Tony Illumilu made it because suddenly the financial sector was opened up, yeah? And, and you know, similarly with um, Strives and others. Yes, yes. You, you know, that you can, that, um, that, you know, we have made the money in Africa, we must also now reinvest it in Africa. Right, right. Profit. That is profit. what is, that for me is the fundamentals of African capitalism. So you're not, taking that capital out and putting it into some Swiss bank, 
but you're actually reinvesting into your continent and its future. Which is what your amazing Prime Minister President of Ghana, he talks about that self-independence. He talks about building, um, you know, Africa and building Ghana, where, you know, we, you have an invested interest in, in, in the sustainability of, the, of that country and of that continent. That's right. Thank you so much, Parmin Devere, OBE. Oh, Thank yeah. you so much for her, for joining us and for supporting us and for advising us because this is really a conversation that we wish to continue across the ecosystem so that we can build a stronger one um, to create the jobs that we desperately need for the continent to grow.